Hi guys, uh, Adam here. In this video, we're going to talk about training stress response measures in sport and exercise. And a few things that I want you to get out of this is I want you to be able to understand the key considerations that you'll have to make uh, for integrating training stress response measures in your practice or in your environment. I also want you to be aware of the common methods that are being used today for assessing training stress responses. And finally, I want you to be able to identify the pros and cons of these method, methods, not only from a technology perspective, but also from integration within your environment and how it affects uh, the, the holistic system that, that you'll develop. The way that I break down training stress response is into kind of three areas of recovery. You got the body, you got neuro or neuromuscular and psychological or emotional. And these can be categorized in a number of ways, just like you can categorize exercises in a, in a number of ways. You can categorize them by the, the plane of motion, categorize them upper body, lower body, upper body push, upper body pull, lower body push, lower body pull, unilateral, bilateral, etc. These are just categories that I created to make things a little bit more simple uh, for me and hopefully for you, where well, let's go over each of the categories. So for the body, we're, we're talking about recovery of muscles, joints, tendons, and ligaments. Is there pain or soreness? Are you hydrated? Is your muscle glycogen replenished to an extent that will allow you to achieve a high level of performance uh, that day or during subsequent exercise? For neural and neuromuscular, what's your energy level like? How's the coordination between your mind and muscles? Are you moving synchronously and are your muscles responding quickly to the signals that your brain is giving them? And also, how is your brain working in general? Is it, is it reacting quickly? And for psychological, emotional, um, are you moody or irritable? Are you stressed or distracted for other reasons? And that's kind of the way that I, that I bucket these things out for now. But you can categorize them any way that you want. The reason why I do this is because when I'm looking at training stress response, I want to make sure that I'm gathering some piece of information that tells me something about each of these buckets. So by organizing it this way, I can make sure that I have some measure that gives me insight into each of them. And now here are the three buckets again, uh, the body, neural, neuromuscular, and psychological or, or emotional. And again, don't worry about the categories, but I just place things in them. So there are a bunch of different ways to measure training stress or training load response. A few of them are here, and I tried to organize them into these categories that we outlined. However, again, the categorization the categorizations are just an attempt to make things a little bit more simple. In reality, the buckets that these training stress response measures fall into are not mutually not mutually exclusive at all. In other words, you know, counter movement jump height could be an indicator of muscular recovery as well as neuromuscular recovery. Similarly, in a wellness questionnaire, asking an athlete about their fatigue level could fall into any of these categories. And now we're kind of going to go through each of these categories one by one. We'll start with the body or training stress response indicators for the body. And again, I've only outlined a few of them here, and these are pretty common today, at least. We have body composition and body mass. An unintentional decrease in body mass could indicate a bunch of different things, but in this context, it may reflect a relative increase in training exposure. And there are a couple of reasons why. The first is because training takes time. So the more time you spend training, the less time you have available for consuming energy or calories through food that would normally be, about, be available in your routine. And also, longer, and longer periods and higher magnitudes of training demands result in increased caloric expenditure. And if the dietary patterns of the athlete or exerciser remain the same, you may see a decrease in body mass because they're not accommodating for those for the excess caloric expenditure that they're undergoing with the higher volume of training. And also, your body stores carbohydrates you eat in the form of glycogen. And glycogen is stored in your muscles and your liver and your muscles use their local glycogen stores to support the demands of exercise, particularly when you exercise at a high intensity. So one interesting thing about glycogen is that for each gram of glycogen stored in muscle, there are three to four grams of water that kind of come along for the ride. They're stored with it. So 
if glycogen becomes depleted following exercise, there can, be, there can be substantial weight loss due to the reduction in weight from the broken down glycogen, but also and more so the water loss associated with it. So if an athlete has a decrease in body mass, it could indicate that they are not consuming enough food or the right types of food to fully restore their muscle glycogen levels that were depleted from the exercise and having depleted muscle glycogen stores could compromise subsequent exercise performances. And finally, I guess my last note on body mass is that a reduction in body mass in certain situations, for example, let's say the day of a game, could indicate that the athlete is hypohydrated or dehydrated. In other words, they didn't hydrate enough uh, following, following the game or following that intense session, which could also compromise performance if it's bad enough. Typically, I think greater than 2% decrease in, in body mass is, has been shown to reduce performance outcomes, but I'm not entirely sure on the quality and quantity of research that supports that number. So body composition falls into body mass assessment, but assessing body composition in addition to or in replacement of body mass gives you a lot more detail. And there are a ton of different ways to measure it, and we'll get into those ways a little bit later on. But essentially, changes, changes in muscle mass, muscle architecture, as well as intracellular and extra, extracellular components can indicate or can infer responses to training. And then you see perceived muscle soreness. And perceived muscle soreness or pain is another indicator of how an athlete or exerciser may be tolerating their training stresses. This is pretty self-explanatory, but if you understand the context of the situation, identifying soreness and pain levels of your athletes or exercisers can help you better understand whether you're eliciting the adaptations that you're trying to elicit. I don't think I need to go too much more into detail on that. Now let's move on to the yellow box or neural and neuromuscular measures. Again, they're just there's categories. So in this bucket, we have jump height, which is a common one, as well as heart rate variability. And I want to be clear that jump, jump height is not, I, I'm, I haven't seen research that fully supports using jump height as a measure of neuromuscular fatigue, at least the day after exercise. But it would make sense that a full body powerful movement assessment, which could be jumping performance, could be used to, to assess neuromuscular capabilities. So what happened or what, what people do or what people look at is reductions in jump height or jump height variables coming from force plates that would indicate that there is some change in movement or movement efficiency. Reductions in, and reductions in jump height could happen in a number of ways, including, like I said, including coordination of movement patterns, neural firing rates and their magnitudes. There may be soreness in certain muscle groups. Your effort could come into play, your, your neural drive, among a, a variety of other things. In any case, it's used to assess responses to training stress and probably fits best in the neuromuscular category, but it can fit into a couple of them. And heart rate variability is a measure that indicates the balance between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system activity. Your sympathetic nervous system is active in response to dangerous or stressful situations, which is what happens during exercise. Although this is an intentional, I guess, stressful situation because you're imposing the stress on yourself or a coach or whatever is imposing stress on you, you apply stress um, to your body and your body responds and it, and it responds involuntarily to that stress excuse me by increasing heart heart rate and alertness blood flow to the muscles and a bunch of other things that prepare your body to perform the exercise your body's really smart the parasympathetic nervous system counteracts the sympathetic nervous system they're they're both active all the time and when i say counteracts i don't really mean that they go against each other necessarily, but I guess when I say that parasympathetic counteracts is that it it influences processes that are somewhat opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. So when the parasympathetic nervous system is highly active, 
digestive and excretion processes are stimulated and heartbeat slows among a bunch of other things that you could see on the slide so it's sometimes referred to as the rest and digest system and i don't want to go too in depth uh, on this subject but in essence heart rate variability assesses the relative activity between the two contrasting systems if your if your nervous system is balanced your heart rate is constantly being told to beat slower by your parasympathetic system and beat faster by your sympathetic system which which results in a higher hrv or higher variability in your heart rate in your heartbeats whereas when one system predominates the heart rate vari variability or the heart your heart rate is a little bit more consistent so the variability is lower that's how that works and we'll get in more into that later and now we get to the purple box or common psychological and emotional measures and again i'm not going to go too in depth here the psychological or emotional state is generally assessed subjectively using well-being questionnaires and here's a sample questionnaire um, that you see on, on the screen there developed by Blake McLean and, and some of his colleagues in 2010. They're assessing perceived fatigue, sleep quality, muscle soreness, stress levels, and mood. And this data can be used to make inferences about an individual's psychological and emotional responses to training, as well as their physical responses. Okay, so now we're going to make an important distinction between training load and training load response or training stress and training stress response monitoring they're not the same thing although they can be which is a little bit confusing and the per but more importantly the purpose of each is different so training load can be assessed in a bunch of different ways and, and here are a few examples on, on, on the left hand side you could assess heart rate metrics from exposure to the training stimulus or you could collect uh, rating of perceived exertion from the exerciser or, or athlete and these are both internal training load or training stress metrics but there are a lot of other ways too some other ways to assess training load would be how many miles you ran or how long you exercised for the number of accelerations and de decelerations uh, you made during a practice or even how many sets and reps you performed during resistance training and those are all examples of external training load metrics but in any case, everything that I just described is, well, in isolation, it is an assessment of training load. Well, that's great, but to understand how an athlete is responding to those imposed training loads, assessments that quantify the responses to those training loads or training stresses can be utilized. For example, heart rate variability, perceived well-being, changes, changes in biomechanics, or objective indicators of muscle soreness and neuromuscular performance are oftentimes used, just like we discussed. And now one thing that's important to note that I hinted on a little bit earlier is that the metrics used when assessing training load and training load response are not always different from one another. For example, if you assess heart rate metrics um, that are generally you know, related to training load and you're assessing them over time, how that heart rate response changes during training over time could be used to quantify how an athlete is tolerating training. In other words, to quantify their training stress response. So if you have a very in intense session and attempt to follow up an identical session the next day, you may see a reduction in heart rate response during the subsequent session due to fatigue. That's an example of how a training load metric could be used to assess training load response. So essentially, you could use longitudinal assessment of training load metrics to quantify training load response in a bunch of different ways. And now we're going to dig into some of the training load or training stress response measures that we addressed in, at the beginning of this talk in a little bit more detail. For each of the metrics that we discussed, we're going to go over why they could be considered training stress response indicators, how they can be collected, in, in your setting and what tools could be used to collect the information and we spoke about this already but body mass and body composition changes could indicate whether nutritional needs are being met as well as the athlete or exerciser's ability to replenish muscle glycogen in between exercise sessions and by assessing body composition in particular we can assess whether or not desired training adaptations are being met or elicited for example, 
if muscle hypertrophy is a training goal, assessing estimated muscle mass through body composition assessment or body composition monitoring can help us determine the efficacy of our training and nutrition prescriptions. If the person is gaining, gaining weight and they're gaining muscle mass, then maybe we're achieving our goals. If, if we're monitoring their body composition and they're gaining weight or not gaining weight, but not gaining muscle mass, then maybe we're not getting closer to our goals and we need to revisit uh, our program design. And also by assessing body mass and body composition, uh, we can gain a better understanding of how an athlete is hydrating during and in between exercise sessions. For example, you know, let's say that, that we assess uh, a player's body weight after, after games versus after practice sessions. And we notice that the weight drop um, between days, the day before a game and the day after a game is much greater than before and after practices. Well, maybe the person either is, you know, glycogen depleted and they're not restoring their glycogen or they're, they're dehydrated commencing the practice the next day after the game. So th those are a couple of ways that, that we could use body mass and body composition um, to help us assess training, uh, the response to the imposed training stress. So how do we assess it? Uh, there are a bunch of ways we can... In so we can integrate body mass and body composition assessment into our client monitoring and like it's 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 numerous there there are so many ways to do it we can have the athletes or clients use a scale or self-service body composition tool such as uh, bioelectrical impedance analysis or bia on site we could give the athletes or client scales uh, and instruct them as to where and how to purchase a scale for their homes. And finally, we could have structured offsite assessments. This is probably the least practical option um, of the three, but you could set up DEXA scans, let's say, or dual uh, energy x-ray absorbed geometry scans once a month uh, for your team of athletes or exercisers at a hospital or another off-site location where the necessary technology and trained personnel exist because you're not going to have the skills most likely um, to perform those assessments and you're not going to purchase most likely a, a, a DEXA unit. They're crazy expensive. And there are many considerations that should run through your head when you're thinking about putting together a system to collect this information. For example, what is an ideal setting for your athletes or clients? What is an ideal setting that fits in with everything else that's going on in your system? Consider the site or location of the measurements and consistency is key. If you know me, you've probably heard me say, say this a million times, but it's true. You don't want to have some weigh-ins occur at home, others occur off-site and others occur on-site. There can be subtle or large uh, differences in the technologies used and the associated accuracies of each, as well as the calibration of the devices being used to collect the information if they're in different locations. You'll also want to consider how the information that's being collected is going to get where it needs to go for you to use it. For example, is the scale uh, that the clients or athletes are standing on associated with a piece of software or a mobile app that automatically synchronizes and collects the data? In other words, is there, a, is there a relationship between that scale and a piece of software or an app? Or is, are, are the athletes or exercisers, exercisers expected to write down uh, their weight on a sheet of paper or type it into a, a tablet of sorts that, that you provide on site? Or maybe you or a fellow staff member watch, like watch the people weigh in and you're recording their weights on paper or on a tablet. So thinking about not only what's going to be used in, in the site of, of the collection, but also how that information is actually going to get where it needs to be for you to use it effectively or for even the clients and athletes to, to see it and use it effectively, something that you need to consider. And the third thing on the list there, standardization. Well, standardization in pretty much everything is key for accurate data collection um, and to avoid misrepresentation of the information that you're collecting. For example, I'm an athlete sometimes weighs in in the morning and other times at night. 
um, you're going to have a lot of trouble interpreting what's going on when, it, when attempting to assess longitudinal changes or changes in body mass over time. And this is particularly important for body composition assessment. It's imperative that the conditions in which the body composition is assessed are very consistent. And this is because each body composition estimation method, and, and yes, these are all estimation methods, the only way to truly get a body fat percentage is to cut somebody up. Um, and you're not doing that. So, nor, nor is anyone, unless you're working with a cadaver or something like that. So, each of the tools that you could use for body composition assessment has certain assumptions that come along with it. And different, thing ma different things matter to different extents. For example, hydration status may matter more in one uh, with one tool, whereas the clothing that you wear may matter more in another. So let's go through uh, bioelectrical impedance analysis, or BIA. We talked a little bit about it before. You could step on a scale and get a body fat percentage. Then you could step off the scale, drink 40 ounces of water, step back on the scale, and get a totally different body fat percentage. So the easiest way to apply a standardized protocol is to have the athlete or exerciser assessed first thing in the morning. This is my opinion, because there's less time um, for more variables to come into play that could affect the measurement um, or to get in the way of what's going on. It's not a perfect strategy, but sometimes it helps mitigate some of the noise uh, or measurement error associated with what's going on. And this holds true for, for body weight too. Um, again, like first thing in the morning is probably the easiest thing to do if an exerciser or athlete has a consistent routine in the morning, integrating it within that is something that makes sense. Okay, so now let's move on to a couple of the tools that we can use. First thing is we have weight scales. They're, they're simple and cheap, but you don't get any body composition assessment out of them. And I mean, this is not necessarily related, but you could also get body weights from force plates. So if you use force plates, like you have athletes jump every week and you're, you care about their body weights every week, then when they're standing on those force plates, it, it collects body mass. So you could double up in a sense and gather body weight information from those devices. Then we have uh, BIA scales or bioelectrical impedance analysis scales. I'm not gonna say that word again, but they're BIA. Um, they can range from super cheap to super expensive. Um, some units are 20 grand, some are some uh, BIA scales um, that you just stand on, um, like they look like just normal weight scales are 25 bucks. And these these twenty five dollars scales or give or take will will be the thing will be scales that you see with metal foot pads on them, and these scales can generally give you an estimated body fat percentage. And how BIA works is that when you stand on the scale and an imperceptible or you can't feel it, electrical current runs through your body um, at various frequencies, varying frequencies, and um, some of the frequencies that go through your body can permeate or go through fat tissue, adipose tissue, um, and other frequencies uh, can permeate or go through fat tissue and water, and others can go through fat, water, and non-fat tissues or lean mass tissues. And by using the time that it takes for these electrical currents to pass through your body at these different frequencies, we can get an estimation of, of your body fat percentage. However, uh, one really important thing to note is that, so the BIA scales with just foot pads, for example, um, don't send electrical currents through your entire body. If you're standing on a foot pad and there's no metal handles to hold on to, the electrical current is gonna go up one leg and go down the other leg. So it's gonna get your body fat percentage or estimate your body fat percentage in your lower body and then it's going to extrapolate that onto your upper body. So if you stand on a scale with two metal pads on the bottom and it gives you a body fat percentage, that's what it's doing. And there are other BIA scales where there are no foot pads. You literally just hold onto a device with your hands and it'll give you your um, body composition. It won't give you your body weight. I don't think, I don't think it can, but it, it'll give you an estimated body fat percentage. And that works the same way, although in the upper limbs. So the electrical current is going through one arm, through your chest, and out the other arm. And again, it's taking your 
estimated body fat percentage in your upper body and extrapolating it for the rest of your body. Um, I'm not saying that it takes that same body fat percentage and makes it your whole body. I'm just saying it uses that information to kind of to to estimate your whole your whole body body composition. And then there are other devices, uh, usually a little bit more expensive, that where you can stand on the scale that has foot pads, and there are also handles to hold on to. And in these cases, the electrical current kind of goes through most of, of your body, and those are the most accurate for getting an estimated body fat percentage. But it's important to note that even with these devices, you know, you can get plus, like, especially even the one with the handles and the foot pads, you can get plus minus. 5% body fat difference just in measurement error. And DEXA uh, tends to be a little bit better. Uh, you know, it's 1% to 2%. Um, ADP or air, air displacement, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce the last word, plethysmography. Um, I think it's plethysmography. I think it's called plethysmograph, but I can't say it, so I'm just going to say ADP. Um, typically, these units are are a little bit more expensive. Um, and the most famous device um, that uses ADP to quantify body composition is is called the Bod Pod. You may have heard of that. Um, it's a, and essentially what it is, is it's a little space or chamber that you sit inside and body fat percentage is determined by analyzing how much air is displaced by you going inside that small chamber and breathing. So. There was a certain amount of air inside that chamber to begin with, and when you go inside, there's a certain volume of air that was displaced. And the way that you can, the way that you breathe inside that chamber, can manipulate the estimations from this device, as well as the clothing you wear and various other things. And I don't want to get into the weeds on this, uh, so I'm just going to move on. Nor am I an expert, so a lot of people know know these things in and inside and out. I don't. Another thing that you could do is you could get DEXA scans or dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. And what how this works is it sends a beam of uh, ionizing radiation through your body, and it can determine not only your body fat and lean mass tissue, but it can do it by the segment of your body. You see, I mean, if you see the picture there, it's a it's a full body scanner essentially, head to toe. And DEXA segregates adipose tissue from bone tissue or from bone from other lean tissue by body segment. And as of right now, it's the gold standard method uh, for body composition assessment. A few other methods include skin fold assessment and underwater weighing. And again, I'm not going to get into the details of these methods, aside from the fact that skin fold assessment is somewhat practical, um, whereas underwater weighing, it used to be pretty big a, a while ago, and now it's it's rare, rarely used um, because it's, it's a big pain to, to do and organize. But skin fold assessment is, is used a lot. And, and if you're going to use skin fold assessment, it's important, to get, it's important to consider the practitioner who's taking the skin folds. In other words, are they trained? Um, is it, is it going to be the, excuse me, is it going to be the same practitioner testing every time? Um, these are questions you should ask yourself because there can be differences between testers, uh, which could influence the results. And now here's a here's an overview slide or a summary slide of what we went over, and I'm not going to go over it now, but hopefully it's a succinct summary that you can use to guide you um, when thinking about body mass and body composition assessment, how it could be applied in, in your practice. And now we're moving on to perceptions. Um, we're going pretty in depth on some of these topics, and I want to bring us back to the bigger picture here. Uh, we're looking at why, how, and what tools we can use to assess training load or training stress response. And one of the ways, uh, probably the easiest way, is to ask athletes or clients how they feel. Um, this is my opinion, and I don't necessarily have research to back it up, but I feel strongly that someone's perception is, is their reality, and thus Assessing perceptions can be of tremendous value for better understanding training stress response. This is assuming that the person is telling the truth, and, and we'll talk uh, more about that in a second. But um, they're, they're very direct. You ask them, "Are you fatigued?" or "Are you how how hard was something?" or are, "Are you how did you sleep?" And you get a pretty direct response. Although the way one very strong variable to consider is 
that person's perception of, of, of what you're asking them. Um, my perception of good sleep might not be the same as yours. So, okay, so why would collecting perceptions be important? Well, if you're asking the right questions, again, you could, you could get a sense for the individual's perceived preparedness to train on a given day. I love how assessing perceptions has potential to facilitate in-depth conversations with clients and athletes as well, which can go a long ways with increasing rapport, uh, which could then further increase compliance and motivation to train uh, within those clients or athletes. And I think that there's a quote that goes something like, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I don't know if I got that right, but in any case, uh, it provides an opportunity for you to show your clients or athletes how much you care about them. And I, th I think we get, I think we get a little bit carried away sometimes with training program design. And it's really about the relationship uh, with your clients and athletes uh, because the effort that is, that they put into training is, is, is most, is probably one of the biggest things that affects uh, their response to training. And the adaptations that they get, if you have poor effort, then you're not going to really get anywhere. So collecting this type of information can also give you insights into the habits that your clients or athletes have and how they spend the other 23 hours a day of the day when they're not with you. This is important because you now have an opportunity to identify and make an impact on routines that may not be great for, you know, that they may be participating in that aren't great for optimizing training adaptations, although they're not occurring in the weight room per se. For example, you might identify someone that never feels ready to train on Mondays uh, based on your, uh, your collection of, of perceptions, uh, regardless of, of whatever they have done for training uh, the day prior. Although this isn't necessarily coincided with the training stress response, you might find that they have a habit of procrastinating on on their homework until Sunday night and thus you know they go to bed late and feel tired on Monday mornings and you can actively engage with that person about that habit that they have and see if there are any alternative solutions that may that may better promote training adaptations uh, in your world okay so now let's move on to how we can assess these perceptions There are a lot of different ways, and the way that you decide to do it will likely depend on what works best for you and the cohorts that you're working with. You know, you can collect it through conversation, you can do pen and paper forms, you can send out emails or text messages, um, there are survey tools to use, and a variety of other ways to collect the information. But again, whatever it is, make sure that it's consistent. Not just the method that you use, but the timing of the delivery as well as the expected time that uh, the athlete or client is expected to complete um, the response. And this, in, this timing could be relative or it could be specific, um, like an absolute time. For example, you may send a questionnaire at 8 a.m. every morning and the person filling out the questionnaire is expected to complete it by 10 a.m. Or that would be, that would be an example of, of absolute timing. Or maybe you send a questionnaire at 8 a.m. every morning and the person filling out the questionnaire is expected to fill it out within 15 minutes after waking. So the latter or the, the second example would be relative timing because it's dependent on when the person wakes up. But still, in both of those cases, the routine is consistent in, in the way that you're collecting the information. And this ties into the standardization of delivery. Once you have a questionnaire, uh, and it looks a certain way, if you change the wording or how it looks or the way that it's delivered, you may not get comparable results between the methods that you use. So once you take time to develop your questionnaire or use a pre-existing validated questionnaire, which I recommend, make sure that the way that it's organized and delivered is consistent. Okay, so what tools do this really well? And I already brought up um, these, these different methods of collecting the information. And you should definitely consider all the things listed on that green box on the, on the side under what, um, among a variety of other things to determine uh, what tool will work best for you. 
pen and paper is fine, um, but it also requires a more tedious process um, to get the data into a format that's actionable for you in most cases. The reason why is because you'll likely be comparing the information you receive on a given day to norms for an individual, and you need to collate that information somehow uh, to see it. And if it's on pen and paper, you're going to have to figure out a way to get it into something, some form of technology or have uh, pre-existing averages on another piece of paper that you can use to compare with. And if you decide to do question and answer, which is literally like you and me having a conversation, um, it gets a little bit more tedious just because there's an extra step. You have to find a way, not only do you have to find a way to record uh, the information that you're talking about, but now you, but you also have to put it in a format that works uh, for you to make those comparisons. And if you're busy and have multiple athletes or clients you're working with, uh, you'll also have to have a great memory for this to work well. So I'd, I'd personally avoid uh, collecting data through question and answer, um, not only because of those things, but also because the way that you ask the question, including your body language, tone of voice, um, the potential presence of, of other people um, and, and what they hear, and a variety of other things could influence the answers that you receive uh, from, from your clients or athletes. And for online survey tools, there, there are a bunch out there. Uh, most of them are free. And probably the most well-known are Google Forms and, and SurveyMonkey. But these, these are generally pretty easy to use. You can set up, uh, you can send them out to, to all the clients or athletes' emails, and when the responses are collected, the data is collected in a, in a nice way, and it's organized, and um, you can set up processes to kind of automate uh, where that information goes and how it's visualized and how it coincides with other information you've collected. And another option uh, here is athlete management systems. Um, a lot of teams and people use athlete management systems, um, which are essentially environments, uh, sorry, software environments that uh, collate a bunch of information coming from various data sources. For example, you go into an athlete management system, you type some information in, and maybe you import you know, a file, an Excel file that also goes in there, and maybe it automatically takes information um, from a piece of technology like force plates or something like that and it all gets put into the same place and these athlete management systems generally have the ability to automatically uh, send questionnaires to athletes or clients whether it's to their phone email or both and with these systems you can generally set up a schedule so that if you want a questionnaire to go out every morning at 8 a.m well, you can tell the athlete management system to do that and it'll do it for you. So you set it up and then you don't really worry about it because when the information is collected, it goes into the athlete management system, which is with all your other information. And then your access point to that information would be going into the system, uh, would be you going into the athlete management system and looking at it. And uh, this is, it's hard. I don't have a visual or anything for it, um, but that's kind of how it works. And then finally, a lot of wearable devices and mobile applications um, that collect information have their own questionnaires. Uh, the difficulty with most of these questionnaires is that, number one, you don't have control over the data, and it usually resides in the individual's phone. So, for example, if you have a client who wears like a Whoop band uh, to collect their heart rate data, they could fill out surveys that Whoop has in their system but you can't necessarily control what's asked on those surveys and how they look and feel. And you also can't access um, the athlete's responses. I'm not, again, this is not about Whoop. It's not about any company. Um, just in general, some of these technologies, um, you can't access the responses unless the client or the athlete gives them to you directly or they could take a screenshot of their information and send it to you. But overall, using one of these mobile apps um, is... Is, is great. I think that the, the clients and exercisers, you know, can, can get a lot out of them. Um, but with your ability to assess the information and gather the information about a group of people, it gets a little bit more difficult. So again, here's, here's an overview slide. And I'm not going to spend any time on it, similar to the last one. It's just a synopsis of why, how, and what tools can be used to collect perceptions.
All right, so now let's talk about using jumping or some sort of power performance assessment to capture a training stress response. You, you, you have a lot of tasks to choose from um, if this is something that you want to do. You know, there are drop jumps where you drop down from a, a box or something from a specified height and then jump up. You know, there are squat jumps, uh, counter movement jumps, sprinting, throwing, single leg bounding, and pretty much, you know, I mean, any any other power oriented task that, that you can think of um, that could be used to potentially assess neuromuscular fatigue. However, a counter movement jump uh, has the most research uh, behind it or assessing it. So for, for this, for, well, at least for this purpose, uh, for assessing neuromuscular fatigue um, and is, and it's a fairly common movement in sport. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about this one for now. Uh, but by assessing power performance in general as an indicator of neuromuscular fatigue, you can gain insight into the body's ability to produce force at, at any given time and how fast it can and how fast or how quickly it produces that force. Force, you know, and whether it be by looking at how high or far an athlete jumps, how much force they they put into the ground, and how quickly they do it with force blades, or something else, and when one of these performance metrics is reduced relative to what you would expect the athlete um, or the where the athlete or exerciser would be at, you may decide to make training modifications to increase the probability that the athlete does not get injured during training or overexpose themselves during training if you're using this as an indicator that there's neuromuscular fatigue and that muscles may not be working right, the mind-muscle connection might not be great, and it's just not going to be a, a, a productive session if you were to go with training as planned. So you, by using these types of assessments, you may also be able to identify areas of soreness or pain prior to, to training. Um, and that athlete may not have known about that because they hadn't yet performed an explosive movement. So sometimes doing power testing in some way sh brings to light certain things that were either painful or sore, which could then um, be used, that information could be used to help uh, modify, modify training if it's appropriate. So these types of measures are also beneficial in that they can be indicators of performance as well. Kind of similar to how a training load could be used as a training load response measure. And if you perform a unilateral test or are fortunate enough to have a system that can quantify differences between limbs, you may be able to gain insight into how each limb is performing relative to one another as well. If you decide to use these power type of assessments, assuming that you're, that power and is a important component of the exercise related goal that that you're a part of. Okay, so how how can we measure this stuff? Um, well, similar to other ways to collect information, um, you can collect the data on site by having some sort of standardized uh, warm up routine that an athlete goes through and then they perform their power task. For example, when an athlete shows up to the facility, you may have a predetermined warm-up that is um, consistent each day. You assess uh, counter movement jumps and then have the athlete jump. Or another way, there are a few mobile applications out there which can assess jump height as well um, if we are talking about jumps. So some applications, you need a sensor attached to your body, but not all applications require this. So you could collect data offsite as well. Uh, one way to standardize this, although you're not totally overseeing it, is that you give the athlete instructions or exercise or instructions on what to do for the warm up and how to do it, and then how to use the mobile application and set up the technology and things like that, and they can jump on their own um, wherever they are. So, in essence, you can collect it on site or off site. Um, those things are both available. And similar to the other things that we've talked about, it's important to think about how the data is going to be collected and how it's going to get where it needs to go for you to use it or for the athlete or client to use it. And this all has to be thought about prior to implementation of a monitoring system like this. For example, if an athlete um, is doing jumps 
on site, how does the information get collected? Are you watching the readout, uh, you know, of a technology um, that, and then you have to write down uh, the numbers that the athlete produces? Do the numbers automatically get collected in some sort of software platform um, for that technology? Is the athlete or client expected to use, you know, a tablet device and select their name and jump on their own if that's available? And then you have to understand all the limitations that could come with that. If an athlete's data gets collected under the wrong name, are you going to be misrepresenting information? Um, so th there are a million different ways that, that things could work. And the consistency in which they do is extremely important. Um, just be aware of the considerations you'll need to make when attempting to integrate any form of power testing, I guess, into the overall mix of, of your high performance, I guess, system, if that's the terminology you want to use. And now we can go kind of in, into the tools, and these are more specific. They're specific to jumping, but at the same time, they're, they're not. Um, and the first thing we have there are force plates. And what, I, what I'm showing there is a dual plate system or two force plates. This allows you to see differences between limbs uh, during a bilateral test or a bilateral task. And then there are other pieces of technology um, that just have one force plate and you can still get jump height and different things from that, but you won't get uh, inner limb differences with that type of system. And then there are different pieces of equipment that rely on the time you spend in the air to calculate jump height and in other in other variables that that system produces, um, like the jump mats, and that in some technologies that use motion sensors uh, to detect when you when you leave the leave the ground and you come back uh, to the ground. And I think a technology like OptoGate is one of those where you have two two beams. You have two like kind of board board things, technolo technology board things that sit on the ground. There's a beam that you can't see that goes between them, and when you jump, it knows when you when you cross the beam, and then when you land, it knows when you cross the beam again, and it uses that time um, to calculate how high you jumped. And then, so these systems can be pretty costly uh, too, but generally not as costly as as force plates. And then you also have things like linear position transducers, uh, which you see on the bottom right there, um, or accelerometers that you can attach to your body or an implement, and these can be used to assess perf uh, power performance as well. They're less, less expensive generally um, than force plates and, and jump mats or motion sensors, but can still cost a, a pretty, dep pretty penny depending on uh, the piece of, of equipment you select. And there are mobile devices or mobile device apps um, that are very cheap and can be used uh, also. Then there are non-technological measures like a Vertec device, um, which is probably the thing you see at the NBA combine where you jump up and you hit a, you jump up and there's a pole full of like sticks sticking out and you jump and you hit it and see how high, see the highest stick that you can hit. Um, or you could set out a, a broad jump mat and you just jump and you measure the distance uh, that you jumped with a tape measure or a stick. There are a ton of different options out there and, and you'll want to figure out a solution that works best in your environment. Now, here's again another summary slide and I'm not going to spend any time on this. You can look at it uh, at your own convenience. And now uh, it's time for question of the day. And my question today is, would you rather be a giant rodent or a tiny elephant? I honestly still don't know what my answer would be, and I've been thinking about it for a while. So let me know what you got. Put it in the uh, Google Sheets file. And um, and yeah, take a second here, and then we'll, then we'll move on. All right. So we discussed this already, but I wanted to provide this visual because I think it provides a nice kind of succinct overview of how HRV works when it's being used to assess training stress response. And I'm biased uh, because I made it, but take it for what it's worth. Um, I want to direct your focus to the bottom left corner for now. Just be aware that I do this. I don't know. It didn't work. Um, just be aware that various factors can influence HRV responses and the ones listed um, on the bottom left 
or just a few of them. Um, just be cognizant of that. But essentially, you know, um, your autonomic nervous system, um, which is your sympathetic and parasympathetic, and there's and then there's another piece too, but we're not going to get into it. Um, you know, exercise and stress cause sympathetic activation, whereas rest and recovery cause parasympathetic activation um, or increased activation in those systems. And ultimately, HRV decreases or increases based on the relative balance between those two, which can either, which has been associated with increased performance or reduced performance, depending on the context. Okay. All right, HRV is a big one. So it has potential to indicate a bunch of things, um, including acute training stress response, changes in fitness, and long-term training adaptations. Uh, however, there are a lot of intricacies that need to be considered. I see tremendous value in using or in utilizing HRV, but you know, at this time, without a dialed-in understanding of how various factors affect it, it's difficult to interpret um, what HRV is telling you when you observe, when just through your observations. In most instances, instances. Um, so I really don't want to go on a discourse, so I'm going to try my best not to. But just be aware that there are a ton of factors that affect HRV, and you need to be cognizant of those factors um, in order to interpret HRV results. You also need to know. Uh, whatever HR, HRV value you're looking at, um, how, like how it's being calculated, uh, and the metric or combina combination of metrics that are being used uh, to produce that value. For example, if you look on the right-hand side, there are a bunch of different HRV metrics. And if you're just looking at a number that says HRV, um, you should definitely try to better understand what that is actually telling you and contact the manufacturer of the product or or, or the device uh, just to make sure that you know what you're looking at. So some studies have compared HRV driven training uh, prescription versus you know training that had been prescribed without make, making HRV driven adjustments and most of the studies like this um, have been performed in individual athletes, and generally, HRV prescribed training has resulted in better performance outcomes. The research is still really young. Um, when I say individual athletes, I'm talking about like distance athletes uh, and people that are competing on their own, not team sport athletes. When it comes down to it, uh, just in general, you have a choice as to how you regulate training prescriptions, and how you how you do this could include one or more pieces of information. HRV could be one of those pieces, um, but I'd personally like to see a study that compares, you know, uh, training training regulated uh, from answers to readiness or wellness responses compared with HRV. I found that you know anecdotally with my own data and training, HRV can be helpful, but sometimes it's really far off compared with how I'm feeling. So instead of aiding decision making, sometimes it adds a little bit of confusion at times. The same could be said for, you know, the readiness or wellness responses. You know, they could add, if I were looking at HRV to make my training decisions, um, throwing readiness or wellness responses in, in the mix uh, when they contrast the HRV values um, could add confusion to, to everything going on. Both tools are, are used uh, pragmatically to inform training decisions or prescriptions. But I really do wonder which is which is better and how they could complement one another if used in conjunction. For example, if HRV indicates you should train hard and you feel like crap, or vice versa, what do you do? I don't have an answer, and I've already gone on too long, I guess, about this. So sorry for getting a little bit distracted, but I want to be clear that I think HRV can be can be extremely beneficial when interpreted appropriately. Um, but now let's just let's move on now. Here's some further further reading on HRV. You have access to all this stuff in the PowerPoint. Now, how to collect HRV? Um, it's really dynamic in that it's a non-invasive and really easy um, to collect, particularly particularly if your clients or athletes aren't on site. So currently, there are wristwatches, rings, chest straps, um, and all those things can be used to collect HRV. 
And typically, chest straps are the most reliable and have the highest validity of the three options, um, at least compared with uh, electrocardiograms um, or the gold standard um, HRV measurement tool. So if you have a group of clients or athletes on site for data collection, there are a few heart rate team software platforms that allow for you to collect HRV data from all these athletes or clients at the same time. Or, you know, if each athlete or client has their own personal device, like a ring or a wristwatch um, and their own personal mobile app or whatever, you could still have them all lie down or sit down together and have them all collect their own data at the same time, albeit with different software platforms or whatever whatever each is using. Offsite collection is also super easy. Um, some devices automatically collect HRV while you sleep and the athlete or client doesn't even have to worry about it. And for those that don't, you can give the client or athlete instructions on how to collect it themselves uh, using their device in their own home. And by now, I'm sure you've noticed a theme uh, in my harping on standardization of how collection occurs. This is true with HRV as well. It's no different. If you're assessing HRV after an exercise session, it's not going to tell you the same thing that it would as if you collected, collected it in the morning. And if you collect your HRV before a coffee, it's not going to be comparable to the results uh, after you've had a coffee. Make sure that your routine is consistent and how and when the information is being collected. That's the most important thing that I can tell you. There are a bunch of different tools available. Um, the hardware can be relatively expensive, uh, regardless of your solution. But the nice thing about HRV is that a lot of tools that collect heart rate can also collect HRV. So you can kind of double up in that sense. If you already have an Apple Watch that's, for example, that's collecting heart rate, uh, you don't have to buy another Apple Watch to collect HRV. Um, it can do both. And that's I don't know why I said Apple Watch, you know, you can, there are a bunch of different things that, that do both, but that's an example. Uh, most pieces of hardware range between $100, $500 per unit. And if you are going to buy something with the aim of assessing HRV, I strongly encourage you to evaluate the research in regard to the validity and reliability of the hardware or the product that you're purchasing. Some pieces of equipment are more accurate and more reliable than others. So take that into consideration. And again, here's another summary slide. Just feel free to browse through at your convenience. We've already discussed each of these items uh, in detail. Okay, so we finally made it to the takeaways here. And I know all my slides contain too much text. I get it. Um, sorry for how convoluted this is. Um, I'll just briefly go over the main points. Point number one, there are a bunch of different ways to assess training stress response. No way is the best way, no way is the right way. There are a bunch of different things that work, and, and that's that. So pick some, the most important thing is to pick something that works for you and, your, and the cohort that you're working with. Point number two, it may make sense to try to categorize uh, the area of training stress response you're attempting to capture with a specific methodology, however you decide to do that. For example, for me, I segregated it out into body, neuromuscular, and psychological or emotional. And by doing that, me or you, you can set your yourself uh, set, set yourself up to include training stress response indicators that address each of the categories that you've identified. It'll keep you more organized. Point number three: Don't blindly invest your time, energy, and money into a training stress response measure or technology without considering how it's going to better inform your decision making or enhance the performance of your clients or athletes. And there are a bunch of things to consider with this, like the cost benefit it could provide for your time and energy, its feasibility of high quality data collection and practice, how and or how it could impact everything else going on in your environment. And make sure you've considered the similar alter alternatives to better understand whether or not the technology that you're looking at is, is good um, compared with its competitors. There are other things to consider, but essentially all I'm trying to say is think critically about what you're about to do before you do it um, to make rational decisions and make sure that you you figure everything out um, and how everything's gonna work before you, you dive in and just start trying to monitor everything under the sun. 
and that's all I got. Um, I hope you had fun and got something out of the talk, and, uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll see you in the next uh, lecture here.